At least I should have bought him just once. Humans form communities. And from that diversity comes a strength. Now get the hell out of our galaxy! The year is 2024. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5. For, for the first, first time. time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And I'm Brent Allen, and I am the one who will be. And we're watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you, the one who is. That's right. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters that are taking that analytical lens we gained as Star Trek podcasters, and we're applying it right here to Babylon 5. No, we're not comparing it to Star Trek and all that sort of stuff. No, we're just overanalyzing Babylon 5, searching for the important messages that Babylon 5 is delivering in its own unique way. The important Babylon 5 messages, not Star Trek messages, because this is not, as Brent said, a Star Trek podcast, not a comparison podcast or anything like that. But to keep us honest, because we are Star Trek podcasters, we play the rule of three. This is a game that limits the both of us to a total of no more than three references to Star Trek per episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> and if we make one of those references, you're going to hear... Now, along with our game Rule of Three, there is another game that we like to play at the end of the show where we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on title alone. We don't look at thumbnails. We don't read blurbs. We don't read the bad blurbs on Netflix or the bad blurbs on IMDb or the bad, basically just bad blurbs. We don't even read good blurbs, although I'm not sure that those exist. Anyway, uh, this is the part of the show where we like to play a game called Time to Pay the Piper. And this is where we revisit our prediction from last week about what this week was going to be about and see how close we were. So, Jeff, what did you say Darkness Ascending was going to be about? That Lanier was going to find something that links the attacks to the Centauri. Ooh. And that he was going to be really stupid about it. He was going to shove it in people's faces. He was going to yell, make a whole bunch of noise. The Alliance was going to overhear about it, and then all hell, all hell was going to start breaking loose. It's, it's, that was such a gimme, Jeff. It was such a gimme coming out of the episode. Like, really? That's the one you went with. Really was. Of course, I've done a lot of gimmies in my predictions as well. Yeah, listen, um, you were spot on, and then you just went too far with it. And I'm not even going to count the going too far with it because you are so spot on. That's exactly what happened in this episode. It wasn't, the entire episode, but it certainly was the main crux of it. So, uh, Jeff, I'm going to give you an 80%. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, that's because it was 80% of the show of the, of the crux of the show. So yeah, kind of was. Yeah. Thanks. What did, uh, what did you think? Well, I said that this was going to be the minions or the telepaths beginning to move into positions of power in the universe. And I wasn't really sure which one it was going to be. It could have actually been both. I thought it might be. Uh, but yeah, they were going to kind of be, their darkness was ascending. They were going to be rising to power, taking over a little bit and, and pending for whatever we've got coming up here in the ultimate episodes. Well, the telepaths definitely took a step towards possibly maybe having positions of some kind. So you're not getting zero on this one, but uh, I think about a point one um, on it because they did mention telepaths and they were in it you 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 did a tenth of a percent i have a lot of respect for that <laughs> <laughs> i'm just glad it's not a zero well jeff uh those were our predictions our predictions are one thing what actually happened in the show is a whole different thing so for those out there who are listening along who maybe didn't watch this one first heading into this week or perhaps they've never seen it at all and they're just listening to us in which case welcome to the journey Jeff, why don't you tell the folks out there what this episode actually was about? Well, Babylon 5 has been attacked. The Zocalo is on fire. Sheridan is a bloody heap, and it looks like he's dead. Garibaldi, he's injured, and he's verbally attacked by Franklin. Where were you? He screams. They needed him. And Garibaldi was, once again, MIA. That is until he isn't. You see, from around the corner... A non-injured Garibaldi emerges, channeling his inner Blaine from Predator. 
as he is hefting some serious firepower. Then he wakes up, suddenly, in a cold sweat. Ah, that was all a dream. But he shouldn't have woken up. At least that's what an eye glowy Lita Alexander tells him, sitting on his bed and saying that she's learning all the cool stuff that the Vorlons left her with. Oh, then he wakes up again, still in a cold sweat though. No Lita there this time, but none other than Lise Hampton Edgar's Garibaldi walks into his room and this is not a dream, but he's still very happy to see her. Apparently, she's been waiting like 14 episodes for him to come back to Mars. But she's here now, and it doesn't take long for her to discover that he's hitting the bottle again. She wants him to come back to Mars with her, but he's telling her one thing and not telling anyone else that he's actually planning on going. He's basically trying to keep everybody happy without doing anything more than sneaking a drink here and there. More on that later. Veer and Londo are working through their day. Even though they're in totally different roles, they really aren't interacting any differently. Veer's going through Londo's calendar for him, and it turns out that nobody really wants anything to do with the Centauri. In fact, Centauri Intelligence thinks it knows that the other races think they know that the Centauri are probably responsible for the shipping lanes attacks. Makes for a pretty awkward day. And speaking of awkward, do you remember back, I don't know... 110-ish episodes of this podcast ago when a much different-looking Jakar propositioned Lita Alexander to get her DNA to, well, hopefully make Narn telepaths? Took her a while on that one, but uh, but she agrees. <laughs> but at quite a price for the Narn. She wants a boatload of cash, a couple of ships that can carry maybe a couple hundred telepaths apiece, and she wants complete silence about what they're doing. Also, the Narn are going to get access to a whole bunch of human telepaths and their DNA. They agree, and Lita is eager to send her people out to find a new homeworld. Then there's Lanier. He's out doing those ranger exercises, and he's intercepted some communications, but he's really struggling to decode them. The whole no doors into the executive offices at Babylon 5 finally, finally has consequences. Sheridan overhears some stuff and orders the Maria back to the station. Lanier, knowing that he's on the cusp of something, all he has to do is decode these messages, jakes a shuttle, or steals a fighter, and heads into hyperspace. But it's cool. Even though we were told that they only have seven hours of oxygen, turns out they have like 30-some-odd hours, and that can actually last 40-some-odd with some uncomfortable-looking meditation, which is a good thing because it takes him more than that long for his theory to pay off. Big ol' Centauri ship comes up behind him, and he latches onto it, records everything that happens. Some other Centauri ships ambush and blast a bunch of unsuspecting ships, and he gets that recording back to Sheridan and Delenn. Knowing what a big deal this is, Delenn goes out of her way to hug Londo in the hallway. Then they call a session for the Alliance Worlds. Every single one of them except for the Centauri. And Londo, Londo finds out about that. Now, remember Garibaldi? Well, he and Lise, they've been struggling through this episode. She still wants him to go back to Mars with her, but that is all off the table now. Everyone knows that war is right around the corner, so he tells her to get off the station and go home now, immediately, while she still can. And then, just like all the Alliance worlds, we are left waiting for tomorrow's meeting with the Alliance Worlds. Brent, was this one darkness ascending or descending for you? Stand by, we'll be right back. Are you ready to take your Babylon 5 for the first time experience to the next level? With our exclusive Patreon, you'll get access to all kinds of cool stuff that you can only find there. Our recording notes, unedited reaction videos, an exclusive Discord community. And you can even be listed as a producer of the show. Plus, we even offer exclusive meet and greets and hangouts. You won't find this kind of experience anywhere else. Get all these amazing benefits, plus the opportunity to interact with other fans from around the world. It's being part of of a huge community where everyone shares the same appreciation for Babylon 5. 
Subscribe at patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. That's the number five in the word first to get access to these incredible benefits. That's patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. We can't wait to see you there. So, I can't say I loved this episode, but this episode feels very important to me. Um, This one feels like something you and I have been asking for for pretty much the entire season to happen. That It feels like those final tumblers are locking into place before something big happens. Like, we've experienced this, Jeff, once or twice a season for the last, like, five seasons. Like, I'm pretty familiar with this feeling. It has that that feel to it to me by the end of this episode for the first time in season five for me though i find myself going i want to pit next i I want to hit next like truthfully for most of season five even after the very long night of londo malari that was a phenomenal episode i've not been like all right i gotta find out what happens next i just haven't been there i'm like i i need i need to press next like i'm i'm in that spot i find myself there again which is a great feeling to have it really is because i've been very worried uh, about this this season um lots of super important information and bits happened uh throughout this episode my my criticism of this though right and 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 we've said this for the last couple weeks so here we are jeff eight episodes left of the entire series we have eight hours left with these people like that's that's all we got you know like yes i know we have some movies The folks out there didn't have all these movies waiting in the wings. Like, this is what we have. To stop and spend last week on a training op was weird to me. You take Delenn sending Lanier out there and then mush that into the same episode with what Lanier did today. That's a solid episode. (laughs) You know, Uh, I'm sure people out there clicking their time. But but he needed space and they needed time to to do something and whatever story plot. Okay, fine. But at this point of the season, like. Well, there were six other episodes they could have done that in, right? Like, yeah, exactly. I was glad that they didn't just like recall Lanier and him going out last week just didn't even matter at all. Like, I'm I'm glad to see that he was still out there, that you were right about that particular thing. In the end, though, for me, Jeff, while I didn't love this episode, I'm not, I, this is not an episode that I'm like, I'm watching this all the time. I see this episode come on TV. I'm not changing the channel. I'm not channel surfing. I might go check out whatever else is on during a commercial, but then I'm coming back to this episode. I love what this episode was doing, though. I love what was going on. And I think, Jeff, this is just my prediction. I think this episode is probably going to end up in the top half of the season, not because this episode is so strong, but because season five has been rather weak. And... I like in another season, I think this would be a middle to lower, lower tier episode in this season. I think this is going to be one of the better episodes. Like I, I, whatever's coming, I think people out there will say like, this is where it starts. Like this, is this is going to mark. I'm guess I'm, I have no idea. I'm just guessing. I, I, yeah, been through a few of these before through, through uh Babylon five. So uh, I hope each successive episode from here on out is better than the one before it. So there's the very long night of Londo Malari. We have seven episodes. I want this episode to be no higher than number nine. Okay. Is where I want this episode to land. Jeff, what'd you think of this episode? Almost exactly the same. This was 100% a setup episode for other stuff. That's not a bad thing at all. Put all the pieces on the board, all that good stuff. We're ready to rock. I, I'm in the same spot where I didn't not like the episode but I wasn't in love with it. What this episode did is exactly what you described. It made me desperately want to watch the next episode. Yeah. That's this one. I I think my favorite thing though, in the whole thing, and I said it in the recap, but like how, how is the not having doors in the council chambers or in their offices? How has this not caused a problem before? (laughs) It's pretty amazing. You know, I got to tell you when I, where I went to college in the dorms, we didn't have locks on our door. Okay. Like it, it was just, it, it was a small school. Everybody kind of knew each other. Um, they did have some problems sometimes and I know they thought about, but they just, we it, literally, it was an open door policy. It got to the point where if we're not going to have, we're not gonna have locks on the doors, we would actually tape the, you know, the little thing that holds the door shut. Mm-hmm. Like you have to turn the knob. Like we would tape that shut. So all we had to do is just push on the door Yeah, to get in. And 
you know, people would walk in sometimes at some rather compromising spots. And I could tell you all sorts of stories, but for the most part, it really wasn't that big of a deal. So maybe, maybe for the most part, it's just not that big of a deal here. You probably weren't talking about intergalactic ramifications for decisions that you were making. Like that's big stuff to, I don't know, just take those meetings and especially with the way, like the, the setup of it, like yeah. Delenn is looking at the screen, having the conversation that opening isn't even in like in her peripheral. Like, I don't know, seems irresponsible. I just love that there were consequences for it. That's all. That's excellent TV that there's, Hey, this is our set design. And at some point someone probably said, Hey, maybe we should have this. And they're like, yeah, we'll write that in. We'll make it a thing. I love that Sharon and totally did the thing that like, he comes in and like, he stands in the door and then like, he backs out. <laughs> It's like, nope. And then, not, then he doesn't say anything. He just like, he just pieces out the other direction, you know, like, oh no, it's all good. Like, did the camera even go into focus on him? Like you saw him, but I think he was blurry like the whole time. <laughs> That's so good. I thought that was great. Well, wh where do you want to go on this, man? There's, there's the Garibaldi stuff. There's the Londo stuff. Uh, there's Lanier and then there's uh, Sheridan and, and Delenn. Well, let's, let's hit the telepath stuff really and quick. Then the telepath stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that one's pretty quick. Okay. Um, I thought it was fun. Just, it was, you know, I, I, I feel I, I am, I'm lost. Let me just start there. I'm lost on this whole telepath thing. Um, where I was prior to this episode was, um, we've got Bester out there with a mothership. We got Garibaldi probably, you know, or in orbit of, you know, thinking about Bester. So we have, have him as a concern. We got it made very clear to us a couple weeks ago that he hates the normals, the mundanes, right? Yep. So yep. got that. We have Lita over here with a group of blips that are disenfranchised, that are looking for a home world, but they remember Byron. And so we've been building to this crescendo of telepaths blowing up. Yeah. But now she's trying to swing a business deal to go like surveying worlds for, I don't know. Well, I mean, so Lita is trying to get to the end result of having the telepaths have their own home world. Mm -hmm. not justice for Byron, not there's this impending battle coming, not we're, we're going to go uh, uh, riot until we get our way. Just listen, we're going to try to go strike a deal and see if we can't figure out how to get our own planet. And, you know, it, it's going to be a really bad pitch to the absolute wrong person. I got to tell you, though, this did not go the way I thought it was going to go. Same. Because when she's talking to this dude and he's like, yeah, we can't just do it because like our insurance isn't going to let it We're we're involved with Psychor and they're going to pull their people. We just can't do it. He was totally fair with her. Yeah. A thousand percent. Like, I, I appreciate how uh, it's one of the few times I appreciate how corporate someone is, you know, like, yeah, he's like, no, but also it's cool. I wish you well. I wish we could do something. But this is we we are not this guy. And he says this line. He's like, you need somebody who has major resources, but is not tied to the Psychor. I in no way, shape, or form thought Jakar in the Narn. You know what I thought? What did you think? I thought the the Lee Edgar Hampton, uh, like, they don't have ties to the Psychor. They've got phenomenal resources. She was just in dude's mind. We thought they were supposed to be married. Uh, Jeff, I'm just going to go ahead and say Garibaldi and Lisa are not married. I don't know why we thought they were. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they are not. Yeah, I don't know. Did you? you I just, that drives me so crazy because I could have sworn up and down they said that they were. I'm just going to go with no, they're not. Uh, but still, like, it seemed like that was a real easy way for them to go. Yeah. To to getting into that. And then that keeps that keeps the telepaths with Mars and Vesters in sight and all that sort of stuff. But no, we went back to an episode one conversation and you're like, have Lita and Jakar really not talked since episode one? I, 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 I spent time like think I didn't go back and look, but I was just like, I don't think there's been any interaction between them. No, I don't think, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think there has been. And they even said it like we haven't really talked since that conversation. And understandably, that's not one you just really dust off and, you know, pick up from again, but it's a great callback. Yeah. I just, to me, I'll just say this, that because they didn't go the Edgar's industries route, I have this little voice back here in the back of my head telling me this horrible thing that I'll just say right now, if we get to episode 22 uh -huh. and what I think is going to not happen now doesn't happen, I'm going to be kind of furious. What is that? I think the whole telepath thing is done. 
No. Like it's just fizzled. Really? I don't know that I think it, but that's what I'm almost Wait, thinking. It's like, Jeff, are you telling me that the Cora's mother, the Cora's father is going to be the last Bester episode? It can't. Well, so I, it can't be. I have a note on the Garibaldi thing. I'll, I'll just pull this in that like, I'm still back and forth on like, is he drinking because he's expressing his disease or is he drinking because he's trying to block that Asimov that Bester put in? And just, I mean, the whole thing, I'm just like, did they just give up on the telepath thing? They're going to, this is the end of their story. I don't think this is what it is. I'm just saying, if this is the direction they're going and I can see the road paved and I'm going to be furious, but are they just like, yeah, you're going to grab some Narn ships and you're going to disappear. And we're never going to touch on this again. And we're not going to have Bester again. And Garibaldi's just drunk. He's not doing a thing. And I'm going to be like, all of that Byron bull for nothing? Mm. For for the record, I think Garibaldi is drinking not because of Bester. I think he's just drinking and he's using whatever excuse he can possibly find. We'll talk about that more in just a few moments. Uh, I don't think we've seen the last of Bester. And I don't think we've seen the last of the telepath thing. We can't have. I, d- like, I don't think we're there. This yet. is the yeah. trap door. This is the exit for the whole storyline. And I saw it plain as day. And I'm just like, oh, they, mm, they can't do this. They can't do this. Well, before we get there, let's finish up this whole Lita Jakar. Yeah. Because the interaction that Lita and Jakar had, the, the two interactions they had in this episode were kind of interesting. Very, yeah. Jakar still trying to put the moves on Lita. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember what we said. We could do a natural mating or direct mating, I think yeah. is his actual word, right? It, you know what it reminds me of is like a 20th high school reunion where it's like, hey, do you remember that one conversation after biology by Locker 316 where you said and I said, like it totally had that vibe of like, oh, this just- uh, you want to head over there right now? Like, uh, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was, and, and she, she's talking about, it's a shame we never got to discover your pleasure threshold. And she's like, I ain't got one, Jack. I'm like, well, Lita's putting the moves back on Jakar, right. man. She's using her wiles. And I loved him. He's just like, Ooh. like, <laughs> who, has, who hasn't been there with somebody where it's just like, oh, oh. Hey, by the way, the, the grown-up adult in me looks at that and goes, that's bait. Stay away from that, Jakar. Yep. That's not going to turn out well for you. Um, Lita comes back with an indecent proposal of her own, and I can't decide if the price is too high or not for her. You know, we're we're going to give you all the genetic material you want from me and all my friends. She's saying that on behalf of all her friends. Like, eh. but and by that I mean the price to the Narns. Mm-hmm. They want a smack ton of money. They want a bunch of ships that are going to go deep deep cruising. I'm surprised she didn't ask for an empty planet on the rim of their space or something. I'm surprised she just didn't go for that. Like, yeah, grant us all of our wishes and you can have whatever you want. You know what this might be? So uh, quick, uh, I have a thought, but I just had this other one pop in. We we've postulated on a couple episodes that this is that like the secret spinoff, you know, episode thing. Was there maybe or is there maybe an idea for like Babylon five, the telepaths? You know, so like yeah. this is the thing where they go off and then whatever happens, but then we pick it up another series, another se- series where they go and try and look for stuff. Maybe this could be another one. That actually those. feels like the spinoff for the comic book series to me. Okay. Is what that, what that kind of feels like to me. But my thought on the, 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 the price for things was I am wildly unclear on the state of the Narn regime. Yeah, do they have the money and resources to do this? Yeah. So we got back in season four where they're like, oh, Jakar, you're the greatest. You should you should be our leader. And he's like, power should not sit with one person. And now we have this, where they can just throw money and ships at somebody for the possibility of breeding telepaths. Like, I, I okay, I guess they're fine. They must have had, I don't know, reparations or something, because seemed to be in really good shape pretty soon after uh, after the war ended. Or the occupation, I guess the war ended a while ago. So... Here's my last kind of note on this. Uh, we have seen since season one, Psychor trying to manipulate the psychic gene to breed stronger telepaths, maybe to just breed telepaths. And they're not good at it. No. You know, they like, they're just not good at it. And what I, what I'm un- like, I know there was Ivanova and her mom 
but is the psychic gene one that's that's is that passed down and is that act like like what is that like because I don't know that just introducing telepathic genetic material into the Narn society is going to reactivate latent genes within the within the Narn. And by the way, wouldn't all those people actually only be part Narn, not full Narn at that point? Like, or, or are they just trying? Because that's yeah, it's not even the same. Spe- it still seems that, hey, you have hundreds or thousands of samples now, but it sure seems like a shot in the dark. Yeah. Like, hey, this it's that whole thing we have here right now. Hey, we did all these medical experiments on mice and it turned out really great. So it's probably going to turn out great for you. Oh shoot. No, that didn't turn out well at all. I'm sorry. Like, like, so here's a question. So we know from war without end, I think it was, uh, Sheridan and Dylan are going to have a baby. Yes. David, have they had any conversations about can a earthling and a Mimbari or even half member, but whatever Dylan is now, like, like have they been have they had those conversations about whether or not they're allowed they can breed like we know they will one day right but like that we did back i can't remember the episode it was second season episode but it was the one with the hair right the picture of delenn trying yeah. to figure out her hair and then she and ivanova started bonding and at the end they were kind of like you know so hey um insert have these cramps yeah yeah cramp menstruation joke so i think that was meant to Wow, I'm I'm gonna use this thing. It's just that was meant to plant the seed uh, that yes, indeed, uh, because of her uh, because of her chrysalisine, she's gonna be able to breed. But what that then says is that it is likely that full Mimbari and humans cannot interbreed. It's like I, I would agree. I would agree. Right? Like like Delenn's a special case because she went through the transformation. So how are the not like? How advanced are the Narns and geneticism stuff? <laughs> well, they might be very. I mean, they're a pretty homogenized race. They all look pretty much exactly. You know, maybe that's the, the way they were designed, or maybe that's GMOs. I don't know. You you wonder if they they do have like different like skin tones on on Narn. Like you're orange, but you're brown, and then that one's red, and then this person over here is green. Like. Like, do they, do they have different skin tones across there? That one's orange with brown spots, and this one's brown with orange spots. So I hate them, and I'm going to chase them to the end of the universe to destroy them. So anyway, I don't think this plan is going to work. I don't either. I don't think this plan is going to work. I mean, I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a manager. I don't know what much of anything, but I, I've got my peas right here and my little, like, four-section chart that you used with your peas to see what moves. And yeah, they don't, they don't, we, we introduced a green bean into the peas. Not going to work. Right. I thought, uh, I thought his little, um, test on her, you know, Hey, there's one more thing. You got to spy on people. Oh yeah. Yeah. I thought that was pretty dirty. I actually rather hated this moment. What do you mean when you say you thought it was dirty? That, that it was just like, that's not, that was, that was not appropriate or cool. And I almost think in a way that Lita, I've one at that point, Lita almost should have been like. You don't really take us seriously, do you? I don't know if I want to take your stuff at this uh, now. But also, I wonder if she knew that he was playing. Like, did she was she able to read that? Like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So here's my problem with that. She he comes in, he says, "We're going to need you to spy on some some ambassadors." And she goes, "I have a moral code, and I just can't do it." What I thought she meant in that moment was she can't give up her DNA. She can't do the mating. She's not going to sell her body okay? because to me, now I'm not a psychic person to me, that is a much bigger deal than, Hey, we need you to spy on these guys over here, which by the way, isn't against your rules. Cause you don't have rules against that anymore because you're not part of Psychor who does have those old rules. And then it turns out that's actually what it, she was more offended at the idea that he wanted them to read other people, which by the way, this is the same girl we saw jacking up in Garibaldi's mind at the beginning of the episode. She apparently has no problems crossing over into people's minds. And then they turn around. I just, I was like, the, it, there was just a, an incongruency there to me that just didn't mesh up. Like, like why was this more important? I, I didn't get it, Jeff. Yeah. I'm with you. Just, I think on both sides, like it didn't, what a huge risk for the Narn. Cause if she said yes, what was he going to, was he really going to say no to the deal? And I don't know, just the whole thing. Just, I don't know. Didn't didn't serve a very positive purpose for either. Fr- frankly, you know what that really sounds like is the hey, I'm gonna float this idea. I want you to do it. Oh no, you're not. Oh, pff, I was just joking anyway. That was don't worry that about was it. Don't worry about it. Ah, pff, I wasn't serious about that. 
that's actually exactly what that rings out to me yeah except jakar seemed like he was being a thousand percent real about it so yeah yeah i don't know it's a tough one i talked about garibaldi a couple times you want to dive into that let's do it his alcoholic guilt is getting to him and the metaphor was really strong in that dream yes very he's got his hand down and it's covering him up he's like the more you fight it the more you'll lose right he's like give in you know and and here comes here comes sober garibaldi with a boss gun that like i want that prop i'm pretty sure it's the same gun he had in babylon squared in his flash forward where he no, was like really i got these guns is it oh yeah i bet like i remember it was just this massive cannon that he was holding in that thing uh the yeah where it starts you know it goes up his body and his alcoholism is consuming him and everybody's you know he's he's beat up and scarred and it's hurting other people and uh, jeff i'm gonna say it right now i haven't I, I don't know what comes next but if anything is foreshadowing what's coming up because sheridan says at some point in this episode i've got something really big for you you're gonna we're gonna need you more than we've ever yeah, needed you is. before there it is yeah yeah we're gonna need you more than we've ever needed you before and it's like okay his alcoholism is gonna screw that whole deal up so i feel like babylon 5 gives us a three episode like radius on something like that it's uh -huh. like he says that within the next three episodes well the next two episodes after this hey garibaldi we need this thing oh yeah boss i got you i got wonk so lita's sitting on his bed when he wakes up He's the, this is inception level now. Cause this is a dream within a dream, right? Like, uh, and you're not going to understand this, Jeff, but Lita is a ghoul. Yeah. Lita's a ghoul. <laughs> Whoosh. Yeah. I was like, Oh, and how inappropriate was it for Lita? To do? I mean, that is, that is pure on invasion of everything. And she's doing it to Garibaldi. Mm -hmm. like, it's not like her and Garibaldi are friends. So if she gets caught, like they're going to, they're going to sort of slough it off. This guy, what, what's Garibaldi's title, Jeff? Remind me. Coach, Director of Covert Intelligence. Okay. This is like somebody just saying, hey, I'm going to grab the Secretary of Defense and just pop into his head. To your earlier point, right? Yeah, we're not going to spy on ambassadors. I was just hanging out in the Director of Covert Intelligence's head, though. Exactly. That's what I mean. The incongruency of that. Like, I was, I really thought that she was talking about her own. Her own virtue, so to speak, Jeff, that we know Byron stole. Uh, Lisa's back. Yeah. The, the, not the wife. Apparently. Yeah, uh, let me read you my exact note on that, actually. I'm not so sure he and Lisa are married. It's really not that clear. Jeff, the only, the only consolation that I have in this whole thing, because I would just think that Brent's just being an idiot now, is the fact that you also think this. Yeah. It was in, uh, it, was, it was Rising Star. I think it was Rising Deconstruct Star. No, yeah, yeah, Rising Star. They're in, they're in bed and he's just like, Hey, everybody's going to say I married the head of this for this. And it's just like, Oh, okay. So they ran off and did a dime store wedding. So cool. Okay. Yeah. And he's now going to be in charge of, I mean, was that like a flash to the future? It, well, I'll tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't a thread that was dropped and never picked up again because Brett, those don't exist in Babylon five. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to have a whole show on threads that they brought up in Babylon five and that they just dropped. And we're going to make so many people back. be like, they didn't drop it. They picked it up here and completely. And I'm like, nah. They, just they get mad it. every time we bring this this line of reasoning up. It's happened quite a bit lately because there's a lot of dropped threads in in the series. Some people have brought up the novels, the comic books. Thank you for that. Yes, but in the series, Abraham O'Linconi for anybody. Where, good thing they made that guy. Can we bring up the poor dude working at the restaurant? <laughs> Felt so bad for him. He's trying so hard. Really? Because I thought he got everything he deserved. I well, I I feel bad for him because in my head, he's the guy who's been taking the phone calls from him, ordering his pizzas, uh, and he's just oh, like, yeah. yeah. I know what you want. Stop messing around. We've been here before. Uh, I didn't think that because I I didn't think this was the same place. Yeah, he called the Fresh Air Fresh Air Restaurant. Who apparently does delivery well because he said like the last time he was here he was there with um sinclair and uh, people like doing something and then everything went to hell yeah that was the Chris chrysalis episode way back which was a another cool callback that was neat i think that was the last time he was there but he's been ordering he's got the uber eats thing going right right and and i think that poor guy's been dealing with him every time he calls i don't i didn't think that garibaldi was inappropriate with the waiter the way he got called out she's like michael 
what are you doing? It's like, dude, I told you three times, just bring me freaking coffee. And you, you didn't. Now he also went on and on. and was like, oh, what are you doing here? I just, you know, you're, this is your fault. I, you know, whatever. Also, by the way, Lise was probably the most inappropriate person in that whole deal. You want to know why? Cause she's got her alcoholic boyfriend who she knows is struggling and she's going to sit there and say, don't you drink while I'm here. By the way, I'm going to order a glass of wine and garbage wine at that. Sure. <laughs> I'm not a wine guy, so whatever. Sure. Generally, and this is this is this is some snobbery coming through, but you're like, give me the house wine. I don't care. Just make sure it's red. That's you just saying, I don't, I don't know wine. Yeah. Which is fine. You don't have to know wine. And it's a lot cheaper to buy the house wine. But also it's literally like, oh, you're drunk, getting drunk on afterburner whiskey. And so now I'm gonna get some garbage wine while I'm holding you to this thing. Also, to his point, Garibaldi brought this up. You're gonna bring me here. And bring up all this stuff telling me that we're here to chill out and relax and you're going to dump this on me? Yeah. I am curious, though, because she mentioned she mentioned something about, yeah, I'm learning more about what's going on at Edgar's Industries. There's some stuff really concerning me. I need your help on this, Michael. I need your help. I wonder if she's uncovering some of the, the telepath research stuff that he was up to. Maybe. Um, did did this read to you? Like, so you remember, was it last week or, or two weeks ago? We got Franklin, what he's going to do after the show is done. He's going to take this other job in six months when other dude retires and the show's over. <laughs> like, yeah, this this is Garibaldi's like post show exit plan. Like, because you're talking about like, hey, have you told Sheridan yet? No, I'm waiting on the right time. Blah, 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 blah. He's planning on moving back to Mars with Lease, right? I think so. And I think they really shown a light on it, too, where he's like, you know, Sinclair's gone doing his thing. Ivanova's gone doing her thing. Franklin's going to go back to Earth. Like, he he went through the list yeah. of post-Babylon 5 stuff. Yeah, this is setting up his his life afterwards, too. He's going to be chief operations officer or something over at Edgar's Industries. I I, I bet he's more than that. Because he's going to be the owner, like co-owner, right? With Lee. Like, Maybe she's chairman of the board. He's CEO or something like he's that. He's president. And she's whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like he's, he's going to be, but he'll be the husband that comes in and everybody's all like, you're not really my dad. <laughs> he's going to be that kind of a deal. Right? Like, sure. Mr. Garibaldi, whatever you need, sir. Right. Except Garibaldi's literally going to be the guy in charge. Like he's going to be Elon Musk walking into Twitter and people are like, okay, whatever. Oh, shoot. You are in charge. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is really happening. Wow. Right. So can we, can we talk about Lise finds the stash? Clearly the stash is being hidden. Mm -hmm. This is the, I don't want you to see it stash because if you got alcohol in your house and you don't care, you know where you put it out where people see it. You put it up on the cabinet where, you know, that's the alcohol up there. Right. And Garibaldi just goes full bore into justifying his drinking. I mean, this is, and I'm sitting here, I was like, this is what alcoholics do. Not alcohol. This is what addicts do. When you get caught in the middle of your deal. And I swear, Jeff, I swear at one point, Garibaldi's talking, talking. He goes, yeah, that's the ticket. See? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'll do this one. I'll say ah, this. I got it now. Yeah. This is my reason why it's okay. Ah, see? <laughs> so Garibaldi just justifying everything. And Lise comes in and she, I mean, she gives it. She's like, this has ruined your life twice before. And my my big thought really coming out of this 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 is not the star trek message jeff no you know this is not what i'm saying but this is something to, to pull out like listen if the people that love you in your life are saying this is not okay for you it's a good idea to listen and and if if you find yourself justifying it that's a good clue that you need to have a wake-up call and you want to get control of it because they're not just telling you that to ride on you Right. And it applies to soul. It's not just drinking, right? This is your job, your relationships, you know, and, and all those things like the people that truly care about you mm -hmm. when they tell you that person is toxic and not good for you. Don't just take them at face value, but listen, give them space. Don't just justify it. If they tell you your job is killing you, listen to them, right? Like, yeah, they, they care about you. They really do. I had, uh, not in an, not in an addict way, but kind of, kind of in that, um, uh, about a year or so ago, I had, I'd been in a season. You were, I mean, you were kind of with me through this, Jeff. I was in a very busy season of life. I had a lot going on and it was actually my friend, Matt, who was my, my old podcast partner. He and I were getting together. We'd been working on a project and stuff together. Uh, that was not a prod. Uh, that was not a podcast. And, and he just, I remember he looked at me and he's like, dude, you're doing too much. You have to scale something back. You've got to, and 
it it is it it was really that conversation with him that made me just sit back and kind of go okay this one cool thing this one really cool thing that i've that i've been doing that's really hard and taking up a lot of space it's preventing me from doing all this other stuff and so you know and again it's something that i would have just been like oh i can do i can handle it i can do it i can i just got to power through it and and get through it and it'll be done like stupid anyway she gives him the no no booze while i'm here and then he goes and has a drink you know it's it 1998 or whatever this king thing came out you know so I, I i get it but even even now i think we we know that's that's not how you approach someone you know who who's 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 fighting addiction but but it's understandable you know yeah. i mean it's 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 so complicated addiction is a disease that hurts the people uh, suffering from you know or, or or fighting the disease and it hurts the people around them and so it's tough so it's really easy to drop those ultimatums and stuff but they are not helpful um, for all of the reasons that we saw in this episode. And so, but also I, I, I get where she's coming from. Well, and even the no more drinking while I'm here. Pretty selfish. Well, not just selfish, but also ineffective. Because, okay, he can pour it down the sink. I can not drink for three days or four days or whatever. And when you're gone, like, it's okay to do it while you're not here. That's what your point being. It also hit me like she walks in the room. He's clearly you know, been, been hitting it, you know? And it's like, d does alcohol not stink in the future? That dude cannot smell good ever. Right. I, well, I mean, even when he walks into a meeting room, like everybody's got to be like, dude, you, I mean, cause even if you've been drinking, you're like kind of sobered up the next morning, you still smell like alcohol. Like it's still coming out of your pores. Like I remember so many years ago when I was working in HR, we had someone who was at work and they were drunk and uh, it's interesting and they and they pulled they pulled this on us it's not um it's not was not against our policy to drink at work it's against our policy to be in, under the influence you know at work and so they were saying i'm not under the influence i'm fine like there's no big deal at all and so we were meeting with them and talking to them and trying to you know get to the bottom of stuff and public sector so we couldn't just snap our fingers and send them to send them going so he wanted a union rep to come in and i was like cool well Go find you a union rep. You sit in this uh, small uh, meeting room, like, you know, four person mm -hmm. meeting room space. Just sit in here. I'll go grab a union rep for you. Knowing what I was doing, I closed the door and I took about 15 minutes to go grab that union rep. We open the door. The smell hits us like a ton of bricks. Union rep says, oh, God, yeah, send him home. Problem solved. But not with Garibaldi, apparently. Maybe after burn or whiskey. That's the thing. You know, the burn happens afterwards and it's all gone or something. I don't know. Yeah, I I just think this is probably a plot hole they didn't think through, or maybe they did think through and said we just can't worry about it because it'll ruin whatever they got going on. I, I think that's the real world answer of of what happened there. Yeah, but I, I think we're agreed. I, this whole piece led to this one little conversation that's setting us up for something in the next week because that's what this episode we're we're talking about what's setting us up for where we're going, right? Yeah. We're going to need you now more than we've ever needed you before. Or you're, we're going to do something really big with you. And his alcohol is going to totally have him drop. I mean, that's what the whole vision at the beginning of the episode was, right? Like he's going to drop the bucket and, or drop the bucket. He's going to, what's the word? Ball. He's going to, thank you. <laughs> I know it began with a B. He's going to drop the ball and bad stuff's going to happen. And hopefully he's going to get confronted and he'll find his way out of the bottle before the end of the show here in seven episodes. Yeah, maybe this will be his rock bottom. Maybe he'll be responsible for the death of millions or something. And, oh, no, I hope not. Well, I don't want that. But, you know, it depends on what you, rock bottom is very personal for every person. So maybe he'll hit that thing. That's, that's, that's just maybe nuts. just a lot of materiel, right? You cost us millions of credits. Oh, God, I can't believe it. There you go. It's Babylon 5, though. I don't think it's going to happen. Cost no, lease her company. Ooh, yeah, something like that. I think we want to finish with Lanier. So I, I want to talk about Sheridan and Delenn and their relationship piece here. Um, Delenn is trying to exercise her unilateral until za mess. Mm -hmm. And she's doing that, sending Lanier out. And was she inappropriate not to involve Sheridan? I don't think so. I don't think she was. I think Sheridan was inappropriate in how he responded to the whole thing. I agree. I've been working up a good mad all day. Why? Oh, well, for, no, 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 no. We got to back that up. We got to back that up. Okay. Let's talk about how boss Dylan is. He's, you did, you did, and she kills the entire thing by going, yep, you're right. He's, 
Ugh. <laughs> and she and she works. She's like, yeah, it was inappropriate for me to do this, and it was inappropriate for you to not do that. So we're both at fault. I've admitted mine. Now you admit yours. Like, did she ninja that whole thing? There's a great book. Uh, it's called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Chris Voss was the lead FBI hostage negotiator for a for a bunch of years. Retired from that and then got into coaching corporate negotiations. And he wrote this book. It's great. Um, I will straight up own. There's some pretty toxic masculinity in some of his stories, but you don't have to read his personal stories. The the techniques he uses are great. And that's one of the big things is just take take the elephant off the table. Mm. Yep, you're right. You are correct. Well, I don't think we should. Yep, you're right. I agree. Boom. No argument. Years and years ago, I took over management of a program and the program was terrible. It gave horrible customer service. They were the government. They didn't have to give customer service. People were required by law to use them. Mm-hmm. What I would, would do, though, is I'd go meet with the customer base, and they were ready, loaded for bear. They were going to scream, and they were going to yell. But I walked in. I said, hey, my name's Jeff. I manage this this uh, this organization. I'm new here. But what I want to tell you I've learned is that we have done a really, really good job in becoming a barrier to you doing your business, and I'm sorry. I'm here to talk about what we're going to do, and you could just watch them deflate. I'm going to start calling you Emperor Turan. <laughs> Like, look at, look at that. D- listen, I don't need a buzz. I need like a, a hand clap or something. That's a cool Babylon five cut right there, man. That is good. That is really good. That's a, that's a good Babylon five. Reference. I'll give you one of these. Oh, yes. Dude, it's just, man, we need to get back to some, to some, uh, it's a little late now, but we can get back to some reviews and stuff. We've gotten some new ones and I missed that part of our show. We could just do a whole episode to catch up on them and just hit that on every single, I'd be good with that. Like <laughs> just all the, oh yes. <laughs> So I, I, I want to read my note here. It says, um, during this whole, to, to reference your part of sure, I've been working up a good, I mean, that's a good Southern way to put it. I've been working up a good mad all day. And now, and he gets to the point. He's like, now I'm apologizing. And I'm just, I wrote down here. I was like, Sheridan's learning what marriage is all about. Right. <laughs> like, I don't know about you and your relationships, Jeff, but that's totally, that happens to me all the time. Like my wife will do something and I'll be all like, and like i'm justified and i'm right and and then like i go to talk to her about it like she's gonna she's gonna apologize she's gonna and at the end i wind up being the one apologizing and i'm like how the hell did that just happen she says like four words you're like and you this and then this and then yeah and i'm really sorry that i did (laughs) yep I just, I, I said, that's just how smart my wife is and how stupid I am. So, um, well, you're not alone there. You're she's alone. amazing. But I just, I was like looking at that and I was like, <laughs> they're just married. That's all <laughs> happy wife, happy life. That's the thing. amen to that. Yes. But yeah. I think, you know, and I think too, it, it's a real thing. We've had a fear that's been validated through a lot of the fourth and fifth season of Delenn just becoming Mm -hmm. mrs sheridan yeah and this episode she wasn't and that was great and thing is a great point jeff sheridan was mad about it jeff i I mean that's so you know you both we both said that we didn't hate this uh episode we didn't love it though like like i'm sorry let me like we both said we didn't love this episode but we didn't hate it like yeah it was fine this episode featured a lot more delenn and sheridan central to what was happening versus the whole thing with byron and the last bunch of episodes we've talked about it sheridan and the lynn seem very relegated to a a sub character level Mm -hmm. and not really doing much i I wonder if there's just sort of a key to this show that like it needs to be sheridan and the lynn like at the like sheridan the lynn and and i mean because it it was uh uh ivanova there for a while like it like i don't they need to be co- central to the to the plot. Yeah, I feel like if it's a Sheridan Delenn thing or a Londo Jakar thing, you know, the very long night of Londo Malari. Yeah, like you've got those are those are your two power characters. That, They're going to carry a show. Yeah, yeah. Like, sorry, Jerry Doyle and Michael Garber. You're just that's not you. Like, which is fine. You know, there's a reason you're supporting. You know, and they're and you're great at supporting. It's good, but I do think Delenn was doing her job and Tilza doing her stuff, sending people around, whatever. Yeah, you could make an argument that you update Sheridan on it, but he shouldn't have to be updated in all the Ranger movements and things. It's not his job. He's got, yeah, he's got bigger stuff he's got to worry about. Yeah. That said, Lanier shows up with the stuff, 
kind of jump in on that a little bit. Just he shows up and he's very specifically only talking to Delenn. And then Sheridan kind of pops. He's like, hey, you did a really great job, kid. That was, that was nice. Thanks for doing that thing. And just the most snarky, passive aggressive. Well, we live for the one. We die for the one. And I was like, oh, he he's saying he dies. He lives for that one and dies for that one. Kind of forgetting that Sheridan is also the one, I think. Does he know that Sheridan is the one? I think so. Was he was he there? Well, okay, so we it's been a while since we've had a good the one talk. Like, so we we learned in War Without End. I mean, and this this is kind of where we changed our, our opening intro piece to, like to kind of riff on that was Sinclair is the one who was, and Delenn is the one who is, but Sheridan is the one who will be. We learned that in War Without End. But as far as the Rangers are concerned, the one is whoever their Intel Za is. Mm-hmm. So Lanier might not actually really know that Sheridan is the one who will be. He's focused on the one, just the one, the one, which is Delenn right now. Because if I remember back to War Without End, I was thinking I was like Lanier was there, but no, it was Marcus that was there. That wasn't Lanier. Yeah. So may- maybe not as passive aggressive as I thought. Yeah, but even if Lanier knows that that Sheridan is destined to be the one, he's not the one yet. Right. So. Fill fill all that snark, boy, because he's got the girl that you got friend zoned over, brother. Yeah, he's feeling that. Yeah. Um. So Lanier does the thing that we saw him do in the training op episode, where he goes into the into the cold zone. Okay, help me out. the The ships that he got attached to, those were Centauri ships, right? Yeah, warships, cruisers. I think. I they deliberately, very deliberately showed the logo, and I'm not familiar enough. Like, you show me a Klingon logo, I know the Klingon logo. <laughs> Right. You show me the Romulans. I know the Romulans. I, I still don't know the Narn and the Centauri logos yet. Sorry, guys. It's still my first time through. Lanier was doing the Star Trek thing, though. I'm going to I'm going to use two right here back to back, Jeff. He was it's like, why have a pilot on these ships? Right. If all you could do is say, hey, go do this really complicated maneuver computer. Why have a pilot? <laughs> Just stay on your ship and feed it lines. Just, Just tell that. it what to do and let the AI take over. It's chat GPT in the future. Well, okay, hold on. And I'm going to ride your buzz because, oh my gosh, season two, Strange New Worlds, the episode where they all lost their memories, the Lotus Eaters episode. Oh yeah. You know, a lot of people didn't like that episode, but I did. I thought it was a, it was a, it was an original series episode, right? It's just, this is classic Star Trek showing up on a planet and having this stuff happen. Sure. But there's a scene or Tagus, she's the pilot, and she doesn't know who she is, and she's freaking out, and she makes it to her quarters because there's a really cool light path that shows you where you're going. Very, very convenient. And she's in there, and she's like, the asteroids start banging the Enterprise, and she's like, computer, what do we do? And like the computer's like, you are the pilot. This is your problem to solve. Do you want to change course? And it hit me. I'm just like, she could, she could fly the ship from her quarters. She could just lay in bed in her gym shorts and underwear mm-hmm. and be like, make your heading 413 Mark 6. Done. To, you don't have to be there. Then who cares how much air they made up the ship has this week to serve your plot? It doesn't even matter anymore. Just go fly the ship from wherever. All you got to do is have an open comm line to the ship. You're good to go. So simple. Literally, it's a drone. And apparently, all you, you could just need a light energy trace through jump gates that really sounded more techno babble than anything I've heard on any other sci-fi show. Cause I didn't understand what they were talking about at all. Thousand percent. What I said, I was like, that is star Trek techno babble to a T this thing felt pretty out there. I don't understand it at all, but it sounds like it shouldn't work, but it does. It works great. It works perfectly. Apparently. So Lanier finds the proof that they need. I had a problem with this, Jeff. I had a, it, it didn't strike me last week, but it struck me this week. Like, so they send Lanier out to look for this proof that the, the Centauri are involved because they suspect the Centauri are involved. Everything this week was revolving around. We have to find the proof that they're involved. We have to find the, not, we have to, we have to find proof to see if they're involved. We need to, we need to find the proof that shows us one way or the other. If they're the ones who are the ones doing this. No, no, no. They're guilty. We need the proof that they're guilty. We'll take any proof that shows us that they're guilty, but we need that proof. Anything. And 
I was like, eh, I don't think that's the way that's supposed to work. And this isn't even proof. Well, I, well, I mean, you know, that was the Centauri ships. Uh, well, you saw the Centauri ships attacking and completely obliterating this other group. Mm -hmm. I saw Centauri ships doing that. What I didn't see was the Centauri government ordering it or anything. It made me think of the Trigati back when we first met Sheridan. Wow. So here's a Minbari yeah. cruiser showing up, busting some things up. Are the Minbari response? No, they're rogue doing their thing. There's nothing that tied this to the Centauri government at all. What it does is it poses the question, hey, Prime Minister Londo, can you account for these ships, because we have the markings of these ships on the video, I'm assuming they have like, yep. you know, the whatever. C can you give us the records of where those have been? There's some proof or, or closer to proof. This was a video. Well, the the um, the Centauri representative that Londo talked to, he's like, look, the Na it could be the Narn. They have access to all of our stuff. And that's not us. And we're going to go to war over this whole thing. Yeah. That transitions us to this, Jeff, another Centauri war. Yeah. How many Centauri wars is this series going to have? All of them. I mean, my gosh, the Centauri just cannot stay out of a war. Like, geez. <sighs> At all. They just, there's no, yeah. And uh, with that, Dylan finishes the episode by hugging Londo because she knows what's about ready to happen. There's a, there's a, Mm, it's a beautiful scene, powerful scene. Mm -hmm. I don't, th I, I'm not going to put this at Mira Furlan's feet. I don't think this was a very well directed scene. Hmm. She's struggling, right? She cries afterwards. She's got the whole thing. It did not seem in character. The crying totally did. I'm just the, 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 the way she showed the way that she did it leaning against the wall, her facial expressions, her expression. It did not feel very Delenn. Um, the hug itself and what she said and Londo's reaction, that whole thing was great, but kind of the precursor and then the afterwards, I think it was the precursor, right? Cause before she was kind of leaning up against the wall, like, Oh my God, this is going to happen. And she was crying. And then he happened to walk by that just, I, I don't know. It, it, it felt very poorly directed. It felt really uncomfortable and not in line with just the acting in the whole thing. And I don't want to put it on Mira Furlan, but I could be wrong. I don't know. It, took me out it took me out of the beautiful moment well jeff with that why don't we get out of this beautiful moment and let's talk about that part of the show where we do boil it all down and we see what beautiful moments this show contained what are the deep moral messages is it holding up a mirror to society is it giving us hope we can be better in the future and how is it doing that in a uniquely battle on five way jeff you get to discuss this this week. You're going to rate this on a scale of zero to five white stars to see just how strong that message is and how Babylon 5 it was delivered. So, Jeff, how many white stars are we giving Darkness Ascending? This one had a lot and it. it. had leadership lessons, right? We talked about that with the negotiating and talking about things. It had stuff around humanity and working with someone with a real disease who's expressing it in a pretty out of control way. Mm. But I think what this one really came down to was... The importance of having confidence in what you believe, the patience to see that through, and then the fortitude to be able to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed in order to achieve that belief. I think those foundational to this episode. Lanier, he has a duty to Intilza and the Rangers and to his heart, both. Delenn is the one and his unrequited love have tasked him with getting to the bottom of these attacks. He knows that he has to do this beyond anything else, beyond his life, beyond the safety of the White Star that he's on. He has to get to these the bottom of these attacks, and that's for the safety of the Alliance, and specifically to him, the safety for Delenn. So he works tirelessly. He tries to decode the messages. He defies orders, risks his life, and then he finally brings in the evidence that apparently we needed. His work is going to result in war. Right. Like that's, that's where we're going to end up. But right now the Alliance is in a worse place. They're in this horrible stalemate that will destroy the Alliance for sure. So he did those things. He had that confidence. He did the stuff and he's moving things forward, but there's also Lita. A lot of this episode is her trying to find that way to care for the people that Byron entrusted her with. Mm -hmm. 
She tries reasoning with different people, with businesses. She's trying to negotiate solutions, but no one's going to hear her out. Earth society can't see past Psychor when it comes to telepaths. Like they've been baked into every part of society and life. So she believes in her cause and offers to sacrifice a piece of herself to Jakar, taking him up on that old proposition. What I kind of appreciate it though, I mean, I mean, it's complicated, but I appreciate in the context of this messaging, her willingness to say no to the offer. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. all the nuance aside to everything, she said no on it. And I think that speaks a lot to her integrity. The two situations and the people were very different, but we saw in them that dedication to their belief in their cause. And then we also saw the different ways that they handled the, their personal boundaries. Um, and for those causes, Lita would not compromise willing to say no, but Lanier totally did. He compromises the chain of command, which honestly might not be a thing he values, um, at all, but, um, as Babylon five does in its own unique way, it offers us the thought and the lesson gives us more than one side to it and then leaves it up to us to decide what that means to us. Personally, I loved how Lita enforced her boundaries on this one, right? Lanier, on the other hand, I don't like, but it's the show's not telling me what to think. It's offering it to us to say, you believe in it, you're willing to sacrifice for it, but how do you, how, what are your boundaries around how you're going to go for it? I think there's going to be a lot more to Lanier's story. I don't think that this was his big betrayal of the analyst shock we've been told is coming. Yeah. Oh, no. But in two episodes now, we've seen him directly defy orders to do what he believes is right. So far in both cases, it's worked out well, but I think his comeuppance is nigh. I think it's a strong message. I think it's foundational to a lot that happened. I also think you got to pull some of this out yourself. And so ultimately, I'm going to give this one three white stars. Fair enough. That's a lot more than I would have given it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I just think it had that kind of the help of the leadership stuff, the human pieces that kind of kind of brought it together. And I think, frankly, it was all those things were, were the story. This was this was the intent of the episode. So that kind of bumps it up about a white star and a half. Fair enough. If you get white stars, that means I get the rating. That means I get to put it on the list. You got to rank this bad boy because we are developing a 100% completely accurate listing of all the episodes in the fifth season of Babylon 5, our current top five. Keeping track at home, it hasn't changed very much in quite a while. We got the very long night of Londo Malari. No compromises in number two. Number three, learning curve. The ragged edge in number four and rounding it out. A view from the gallery. Brent, where do you put darkness ascending? Yeah, I I said this was going to go in the top half of the season. This is going to be in the top half of the season, although just barely for me, Jeff. I'm looking at the list. Uh, It's not top five yet for me. It's not top five. But I do see uh, Day of the Dead here at number six, Mm -hmm. followed by at number seven, Meditations from the Abyss, which was what we had last week. Last week was kind of like, a hey, this one was better. This one is significantly better. So if Day of the Dead, or I'm sorry, if Meditations from the Abyss is the best of the right now, this one easily sits up there. So did I like this better than Day of the Abyss or View from the Gallery? I think I, or Day of the Dead, I'm sorry. I think I liked actually Day of the Dead better than I did of View from the Gallery because Day of the Dead, that's the one where where Morden comes back and, and uh, uh, Lockley's uh, old girlfriend comes back and, and all that, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of dug that episode. Like it was a little weird, but I. My memory says that I liked that episode. So I'm going to slot this right underneath Day of the Dead. Okay. I I like this episode. This is in that, like, I like it. I don't hate it. I don't love it, but I don't hate it at all. So I'm going to put this in underneath Day of the Dead, but I easily, I could actually see this one bumping up one or two, you know, give or, give or take one or two. Like, I think there's, there's a handful of episodes right here that you could kind of put them in a bag, shake them up, pull them out. And that's, this is just how it's landing. Well, this is the absolutely definitive list until it's not when we get to the season wrap up. And then it will be set in stone and it is. Exactly. Then it's done. Yes. Yes. And I think I think a lot of these episodes, Meditations being one of them, this one, another one, when we look back over what they lead to, we might see them. Very, these are ones I can definitely see us potentially looking at pretty differently. Possibly. Well, Brent, that's it for Darkness Ascending. Next week, we are watching And All My Dreams Torn Asunder. For the first time. Now we've never seen these episodes before. We don't read 
descriptions. We don't read synopses. We don't look at thumbnails. We avoid everything we can about these outside of the title. And the fun game we like to play, our prediction game, is where we guess what the next episode is going to be about based on the title alone. Brent, what do you think And All My Dreams Torn Asunder is going to be about? So the title sounds an awful lot to me, Jeff. Uh, If this episode is focused on Sheridan at all, this is the alliance starting to break up. I don't know that it, this is focused on Sheridan though. So I'm, I'm not ready to say that. We know that the, the, the alliance has to last for some time. So here's where I'm going to say, I think uh, we're going to catch the, the next half of this whole plot where everything moves. The Centauri are going to be charged with attacking the shipping lines. I think Londo is going to get railroaded. Absolutely. Cause remember Vera's like, you haven't been invited to this closed door meeting. Right. So we're going to get that closed door meeting and Londo's going to get absolutely railroaded by this whole thing. And I'm going to help. I'm going to throw out a bold prediction, Jeff. All right. It's listen, it's the summer uh, here in just a couple months. People are going to be or like a couple weeks anyway. Uh, training camp for football is going to be starting American football. And people are going to be making all sorts of ridiculous, bold predictions that in no way, shape or form are possibly going to come true until they do. So here's my bold prediction. You know how Londo has always been destined to be emperor, but all the way back in Signs Importance, we learned that, hey, visions don't always come to tr- come to pass. Uh, Londo is not going to become emperor. That is going to get burned to ash. His dream of being emperor is going to be torn asunder, although it's not really his dream anymore. He'd rather just pass on it if he could have it his way uh, because visions in Babylon 5 aren't set in stone. So that's my prediction is the Centauri are going to get charged. Ron Londo's going to be railroaded and something's going to happen where he is no longer going to be the emperor. Cause maybe it's fear. That's very bold, but also it makes sense because like you said, it's not his dream to be emperor. He'd pass it on, but we often forget that nightmares are dreams too. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's his nightmare being torn asunder. There you go. Well, my prediction is much more pedestrian than yours. I, I I'm just going to follow the story ahead, right? So we're either going to dive in, right away to that alliance meeting or be coming out of it. But either way, Londo's going to bust in totally uninvited. He's going to profess the innocence. We're going to see loud bloviating, you know, Londo again, saying all this stuff, making threats or whatever. They're not going to eat it up. The dreams of unity, the interstellar alliance are going to be torn asunder and the episode's going to end in all out war ships firing on each other. And we're going to be back to just that high action that uh, we saw. Is it, everybody against the Centauri or is it everybody against each other? Because the whole thing is just gone. Boo. I think it's everybody against the Centauri for this episode. We're going to find out right here next week. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. Please don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you're watching this, leave us a rating and a review and please share this podcast with someone that loves Babylon five or is just about to fall in love with this incredible series. So until next time, Hey Jeff. Yeah, man. What's up? So imagine this, imagine here we are two years plus into this journey. Imagine how much faster we could have gone through this whole series. If we had like 200 telepaths doing it with us, dude, that would be wild. Dude. I like, we got Babylon five for the second time coming up. We got some movies. We got some new series. We got some other ideas. Look, all we gotta do is get them some mics and a camera. Should be good. I, only thing though, I, I I don't I don't think our insurance would cover that. Eh, only if they find out about it. It's like the trampoline in my backyard. I don't know, man. I'd say we just get the hell out of here. Initiating getting the hell out of here maneuver. We're not some some deep space franchise. This station is about something. Um, and then also I'm noticing these wicked awesome uh, uh, candlesticks right behind. Yeah, those candle holders are great. Is this, that's a cool just setup. I mean, even it's like a red cup kind of like the whole little scene is yeah. really great. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I think Delenn shops at the same uh, interior design store that uh, Quark shops at. <laughs> so.